Hello, everyone. It's me, the Rambling Man. I'm here with you to talk about the newest season of Doctor Who. And we're halfway through already. That's quite crazy. Only four episodes in, and that's halfway. I think it's quite crazy how short this season is in comparison to what we've had. We used to have 12 or 13 episodes as a standard, and that gave us more time to sort of stew in these stories. Unfortunately, I doubt we're going to get any two-parters this season, which is a crime against the Doctor Who format, in my opinion. Look, I understand the appeal of each episode being its own story, with like new locations, new monsters and new aesthetics, but man, I miss the two-parter episodes, where we would get a thicker stories, more intrigue and twists and whatnot. <laughs> Fans of Classic Who are here like, two-parters? That's rookie numbers, mate. I remember when there were five-part stories. <laughs> but hey, we're finally here. There's a new Doctor, new companion, new series. How has it been? Well, that's what this video is about. I'm going to look at each episode, sort of giving an overview and my thoughts about it, and then I'll give a little conclusion at the end. So, we start with Space Babies. <laughs> so, <laughs> what a weird first episode. Like, honestly... I think the idea is pretty fun. I like the general premise, right? It's silly, but it's not like Doctor Who has never been a little silly before. And the whole location is a callback to Russell T. Davis's first season, right? Having Ruby's first trip in the TARDIS be to a space station is so reminiscent of Rose's in The End of the World. We even have a callback scene where the Doctor turns Ruby's phone into the superphone, just like Eccleston did to Rose Tyler. But I think my main gripe for this episode is the pacing of moments like this. Nothing really settles. Nothing takes a moment to pause and let these characters just sort of exist together. This scene with the phone is a brilliant example. In End of the World, you had this wonderful moment between Rose and the Doctor, and it was slow and it was quiet. They weren't pushing the plot forward, they were just sort of existing together. There was no music. We have time to see these two strangers actually talk to each other. And they're not friends yet, they are strangers. Rose has just run off with this random man through time and space, and they don't know each other. So we see their relationship begin here, truly. And there's this realism and honesty to Rose. She's processing where she is, and it's mind-blowing. It's taking her time to really come to grips with what's going on. And so you have this scene where these two characters get to know each other. They clash with each other. They laugh with each other. They bond. It's a great moment that is a breath of fresh air. And in Space Babies, unfortunately, we don't really get a moment on the same level as that. And what sucks is we haven't actually seen the relationship between the Doctor and Ruby grow much at all. With previous Doctors, it takes the Doctor and their companion a couple of episodes to really connect with each other, to trust each other, to really strengthen the bond between the two of them. But with Fifteen and Ruby, I feel as though we've jumped into just being besties pretty much instantly. And that's my main gripe with this season so far. The dynamic between these two... It just, I can't fully buy into it. It feels as though a lot of their relationship has been built up between episodes and not on screen. Also, another weird thing that didn't vibe with me completely is the music in this episode. And that really sucks for me to say because I love Murray Gold's score. And it is a great score, but the whole thing is underscored. And I think it's way too intrusive. We don't need music in every single scene, and if anything, it would do the episode good to have it stripped back. The lack of music would give some moments space to breathe, to settle and sit, and it'd give other moments more impact, and it would sort of make the themes and the music stand out more. And I think it might help just with the pacing of the show in general. But as it stands, there is this constant music going on underneath, and it just really took me out of the episode when I first watched it. Okay, so let's get to the actual story then. Again, it's wacky as hell, man, but I... Yeah, I kind of liked it. I certainly enjoyed it. It had that weirdness that only Doctor Who can really get away with. Seeing the Doctor's joy as he sees these babies operating the ship, and like seeing them all interact with these little human beings, it felt so out of pocket, but not necessarily in a bad way. And you do see some really interesting characterization from our main two characters. Ruby showed a real boldness here. This girl has confidence. We see this to be a defining characteristic of her in later episodes, willing to walk head on towards the danger. She also shows an intellect. She actually figures out what's going on on this ship 
before the doctor. It speaks to her awareness of her surroundings and it gives us a sense of her critical thinking, her problem solving. I just needed a bit more of a sense that this was the first time she'd ever gone to space, gone through time. I just don't fully believe that this is a real person from the present day who is suddenly on a spaceship for the first time. We didn't have a real moment where I bought that she was shocked and in awe of where she was. Shooty's first episode of this season just shows him to be a charismatic, flamboyant and joyful regeneration. I love the energy that he brings to the show. To see the Doctor get scared was an interesting premise and seeing him wrestle with that fact, using his knowledge of his own nature to inform him on what is going on was a lovely moment. This is a Doctor who is a lot more self-reflective in touch with his own emotions and understanding his own nature, which is a lovely change from previous generations. We are very far away from the 12th Doctor asking Clara if he's a good man. <laughs> in general, it gives his Doctor a more upbeat feel, which I think shooty nails whilst making it feel natural. But if you know me, then you know I love it when the Doctor gets dark. My favourite moments in the history of the show are when something happens that makes the Doctor snap and they let out some of that ancient rage and anger. And I'm intrigued to what will be the catalyst for us to see that side of this new face. And I think that Shooty has the acting chops to probably bring the goods when that does happen. And I think it'll really contrast with his usual persona. I don't really have much to say about the plot of the episode. Like it was, it was fun. It wasn't remarkable, really. Like the bogey monster was interesting. I actually really liked the design. I think it fit well into the story of the episode, even if it was a bit silly and gross. <laughs> but what this episode did do was reinforce the two main mysteries of this season. Who the hell is Ruby Sunday and who is her mum? The scene where it snows is great. It actually slows down and we see the Doctor actually confused as to what is happening, trying to piece things together. There is some kind of reality warping here and if not, then some kind of time warping. But I have theories and I'll talk about it later. It also gives us another look at Susan Twist as a different character. This will be a recurring theme throughout the show. Susan Twist is an actor who plays a variety of different characters, first seen in Wild Blue Yonder, and she's appeared in every episode this season, every time playing a different character, and it's very interesting. So yeah, a pretty mid-episode, which is my main problem with it. This is the opening to this new Doctor's season. I think we needed more. We needed slower moments with Ruby and 15. We needed something not so out of left field. We don't need to start the show off with CGI babies. <laughs> I feel like so many people would have tuned in just to be turned off by the apparent whimsy and kiddie nature of this episode, alongside that ADHD inducing pace. This might be why they released the first two episodes together to give new audiences a broader sense of what the show is, but I don't know. I feel like it was a weird choice to make this episode one. I'm not gonna give numbered scores, by the way. I feel like I can't condense all of these thoughts into one number, so I'm just gonna say I enjoyed it, but it definitely isn't the strongest episode. The Devil's Chord. I really wanted to love this episode, but I think I kind of just liked it. I'm a musician by trade, so any music related stuff is really interesting to me. But this episode just didn't really hit at home for me. I think it's had a great setup and it had great elements, but it just sort of tripped at the last hurdle in my opinion. So let's break it down. First of all, I'm just gonna get out in the open so people can judge me, but I don't really know the Beatles that well. But obviously I know their music, I know their like most famous tracks, <laughs> but like, I don't know, I'm not super enthused by them. So to me, I thought the people who played them did a pretty good job because I don't really know what they were like individually. Uh, I know that there was a bit of hoopla about the casting and the actors not looking like the actual members of the Beatles. But personally, I thought it was fine. So the premise for this episode was really interesting. This guy, this teacher, plays a tritone, the devil's chord, and summons Maestro. And this boy here, Henry, is Maestro's kid, and he appears right at the end of the episode, still as the same kid. I am very intrigued as to what's gonna happen with Henry going forward, because obviously he is funky. If he is Maestro's son, then, you know, he could have some powers and he could sort of be part of that pantheon. We'll get to that later. But yes, very interested. That's gonna be an interesting sort of plot point going forward. I really love the idea of music being perverted and just not existing in the world, how catastrophic it would be. It is so integral to us as human beings as a species, so taking it away would have huge ramifications on the world. And Maestro as a character, played by Jinx Monsoon, was 
friggin' brilliant. She just had so much fun and just brought so much to the role. And the idea that the children of the toy maker are being set free and running amok around time and space. The idea of weaponizing music is so brilliant. And I think they did a great job of visualizing it here. The giggle being an inherited musical trait from the toy maker is also a really nice touch. And again, we see the doctor's actually terrified of Maestro. And I think that fear is very grounded. He knows his limits. I also love the use of the sonic in this scene. It's an actual sensible use of the device to dampen the sound around him. The sonic has actually been used very well so far. Nothing intrusive. It's been used in ways that make sense and are not just overpowered and solve all the problems. It's a great departure from what we've sort of had in the past. I'll talk about it in my video linked here. So good thumbs up from me about the sonic screwdriver. I think it was the ending that I just didn't really vibe with. Like, I like the idea of a holy chord banishing Maestro. Makes sense. And having John Lennon and Paul McCartney complete that chord due to their musical genius was a lovely touch and actually made them contribute to the story. I don't really know why they were there, but hey, I can, I can look past that as just coincidence, I guess. I just thought that fight was so cringe. I hate it when people on screen are obviously not playing the instrument that you can hear in the music. It's a pet peeve of mine. It, it takes me out of the action completely. I'm a professional cellist, so when it comes to string playing, Oh, I know when string players are actually playing. So the whole violin section was just horrible. It really put me off. And that just gave me a sour note, I think, for the whole, for the whole episode. It just really annoys me. So, interesting ideas. We do see Ruby and 15's relationship start to develop more here. They have more time to connect with each other. And the scene where the Doctor takes Ruby to the alternate future is great. It's a great scene. The Doctor has a bluntness, a seriousness to his delivery. And I think he overlooks how hard this could hit. Ruby. And so when she starts crying, he realizes what he's just shown her, that it might be too much. So he closes his eyes and he embraces her. It's really raw and real. And I love how Maestro reality warps, pulling them into this liminal space with just a piano. And things like the Doctor hearing the non-diegetic music, breaking down the fourth walls as this reality-bending godlike being bends the very rules of the television show we are watching. I think more could have been done with this idea, but the glimpses we get of this are great. And then there's the dance number at the end. It's a choice. I guess it's a bold move. I don't know how I feel about it. And I'm sure it's one of those things that will divide the fan base. But all in all, I think it was a good second episode. I honestly do think that it actually could have benefited being a two-parter. There was just a lot of stakes. There was a lot going on. And I think if they had prolonged it, made it just a bit more fleshed out, a slightly longer story, it could have benefited greatly. And so we move on to the next episode. Boom. <laughs> I'm going to unashamedly jump on the bandwagon of every single Doctor Who YouTuber and say, Moffat is back, baby! <laughs> Undeniably, I think this is the best episode so far. Moffat has a great knack for just sort of dropping into Russell T. Davis's series and writing an absolutely killer episode. It's one of his talents. This sort of gave me everything that I wanted from this episode. The setting was gritty, futuristic, fascinating, intriguing. This Anglican army fighting ghosts, the ambulances perverted by the capitalistic desire for profit. And the idea that profit was sort of the main villain was very interesting. There was just a lot of good setup for this episode, but what Moffat actually did with it was even more genius. We're in this fantastical, crazy war zone, but we spend most of the runtime standing still. The Doctor barely moves because he can't. And so we see him in this extremely tense and life-threatening scenario. We have to see him deal with it. We see him pushed to the brink. We see how he keeps calm. We see him employ every method he can to solve his situation. We see his vast intellect, how he knows the weight of something just by looking at it. He has immense control of the balance in his body, his heart rate. This regeneration also has this huge connection to music. You see it in the jukebox in his TARDIS, singing in the Christmas special and the Devil's Chord. And now we see it here. It's a method by which he calms down. He sings the Sky Boat song. I think it's a lovely touch. It fits with his personality really well. This whole episode is just like a mini character study for the Doctor, and it allows us to spend time with him and Ruby in this terrifying scenario, seeing them work together, keep each other calm, make each other laugh, be friends. Oh, 
it's it's just great. It's just written really well. I don't really want to talk too much about it here. I want to do a specific video on it sometime soon because I just think there's so much to dive into, so many tidbits. My only gripe is that by the end of the episode, the Doctor and Ruby are treating Monday Flynn and Splice, these two random people, as though they're besties. Like, they've literally known each other for possibly like 30 minutes max. But that's really the only thing. I disliked about the whole thing. I genuinely, the best episode in the whole season, actually the best episode of Doctor Who that we've had in years. Moffat, you are a beautiful man, but I have to say some of those references to your older material were just a bit forced, come on. <laughs> And so we move on to 73 Yards, probably one of the most controversial episodes so far. <laughs> I actually really enjoyed it. I think people either hate this because it's confusing and doesn't really make any sense and doesn't answer any of the questions it poses, or they love it because it's confusing and doesn't make sense and doesn't answer the questions that it poses. <laughs> I love the Welsh folklore. I love some of that homeland representation, am I right? You probably can't tell, but I am Welsh. <laughs> And getting rid of the Doctor instantly is a bold choice and it gave us some time to spend with just Ruby and we needed more time with Ruby. I think a character needed some more depth and we got a glimpse of that here. We saw her work her way through this weird situation and chug on through life, trying to work things out, having people leave her, everyone turn away from her. It dived into her psyche, really. We have seen that the fact that her mother left her abandoned when she was a kid is something that has affected Ruby's character for the whole of her life. She doesn't know why she was abandoned and this episode plays on that fear. The fear of not knowing why people turn away from you. The fear of ending up alone, isolated. The premise is really creepy. 73 yards away is this woman doing weird hand gestures, wearing black. It's weird and scary. I don't really mind the political arc of this episode. As Ruby said, it was her reason to live, to save the world. And so we see her achieve that through time and effort. It wasn't a quick solution, but she used her ingenuity and creative thinking to force a situation to occur that changed the course of history. And then we find out that it was all a loop, an alternate future, the woman was her, maybe from an alternate timeline, sent to stop the future from happening. It's kind of a paradox. How does she travel back in time? How, how does she keep 73 yards away? What is happening? I, I don't know. I think we actually might find out more about what is going on later when we find more about Ruby and who she really is. And I think that depending on what we find out, that will depend on what my opinion of the episode is. Because if we actually find out nothing or if the information that we find out has nothing to do with the stuff that happens in this episode and it doesn't explain anything then i have a hard time fully buying it and fully enjoying it with the knowledge that there are no rules and what happens doesn't really make sense i think that would detract from my enjoyment of the episode on a rewatch. if we find out nothing then i'll have to you know reevaluate, rethink about it but if you find stuff out that bolsters the episode and makes it make more sense, then I think I can carry on enjoying it and I might enjoy it even more. It also didn't have a title sequence at all. And that was weird. It instantly threw me off, made me feel strange. But I think it worked. It played into the mystery of the episode. But I enjoyed it. I thought it was interesting and weird and creepy. And I think that Millie Gibson did a great job. So let's talk about Ruby for a little bit. Ruby is a weird character and she's obviously special. The first thing that indicates this is the snow. The snow being brought through time, through reality. She makes it snow, and we don't know why or how. <laughs> the Doctor seems to think that it's the same snow as on her birthday, maybe? I don't know why he thinks that, but sure, let's go with it. Second of all, when Maestro has her captured in the air, a song plays. And it is the same musical motif as the trickster from Sarah Jane Adventures. If you don't know the trickster, he is freaky and scary. I was terrified of him as a kid. Editing this together is scary because I don't like looking at his face. But he is this super powerful godlike being from the pantheon of Discord. The same pantheon as the toy maker and maestro. So this indicates that Ruby has something to do with the pantheon, something to do with the trickster, which would be very, very cool. Also would explain the snow, as we saw. Members of the Pantheon have reality warping powers, so if she were to be a part of it, being able to make snowfall would totally fit into that power set. 
And then we have 73 yards, which poses so many questions. How did Ruby become the woman in black? How did she teleport, following Ruby wherever she goes? How did she go back in time to become the woman? The question of, is this all Ruby's way of making sure the Doctor doesn't stand on the circle in the first place? Does she have that level of power, either to consciously or subconsciously create alternate timelines and change the past? She is the big mystery of this whole season, and I'm excited to find out who she really is. So, conclusion. I think we had a weird, slightly bumpy beginning to the season, but these last two episodes have been instant classics in my opinion. If they can keep this level of interesting stories and character development, I think that the second half of this season will just be amazing. I have to say, I've been so blown away by the amount of hate that certain sections of the internet have given this show so far. Attacking the show because Shuti is a person of colour, or actually more so that he's gay and that the show is woke and camp. Like what a one, a horrible position, but two, what a stupid thing to attack the show on. Like, I don't like this gatekeeping that the show is disregarding its core audience. It's not. It is still Doctor Who. Doctor Who has always had political undertones to it. We had the same exact thing with Jodie, people attacking the show because she was a woman. And that was horrible and stupid. Unfortunately, the series that she was a part of wasn't that great and had really bad reception. So it gave people attacking it for the stupid reasons, ammo, and a feeling that they were right. Look, this season is not perfect. But what season is perfect? I think we have a fantastic interpretation of the Doctor here. And Shooty should be proud of the work that he has done. Every Doctor is different in so many different ways. And there's not been a single moment in this series where I've looked at Shooty's regeneration and thought, hmm, that's not the Doctor. I think he's brilliant. I, I, I think he's just getting started. And I think we need to just ignore the people who are attacking him and attacking this show for those stupid reasons. Anyway, sorry. <laughs> got a bit heated then. Thanks for listening to me ramble on about this show, guys. I'd love to know your thoughts about the series so far. Chuck them down in the comments. Don't forget to like and subscribe and check out the channel for more nerdy content. But that's all from me. Bye!